الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Okay, so it's a Friday evening and the masjid is packed. I think we could do a better salam than that, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's way better, Allahumma barik. May Allah bless everyone here who attended this lecture. It's a, an absolute pleasure and honor, and it brings a lot of joy in the heart to see the masjid packed like this. Wouldn't you say so? Absolutely. Absolutely. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. This evening's panel discussion, inshallah ta'ala, is titled Open Sinners and Secret Servants. So we want to talk about four aspects of that, inshallah, which I will be putting on a question to the panel here. And it is an absolute honor, pleasure to be joined with Sheikh Abu Sama al Dhahabi, Sheikh Ustad Abu Taymiyyah, and GLM's Imam. Sheikh Mustafa Abu Rayyan. Like I said, four different angles, inshallah. First and foremost, sinning openly, being comfortable, and sins being nothing except for swatting a fly. And also sinning in secret. And then being pious, and also showing off your ibadah. And then we want to talk about the secret worshipper. So to start off, inshallah, we're going to go back to basics. And I want to ask the panel, bidnillah, what is a sin and what are the consequences of committing sins? Tafadhal. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Amma ba'du. Because I'm the oldest one on this stage, I want to take this opportunity to pull rank up here in a nice positive way. And to speak on behalf of the elders of our community, the shiyukh, mothers and fathers, as well as the admin, even those people who started this masjid a long time ago. And I say on behalf of all of those people that I am uh, extremely uh, pleased to see this amount of youngsters in the masjid on a night like this. I know that it's very easy that you guys get criticized all the time and you get put down all the time because there are a lot of challenges and a lot of tahadiyat that you have to deal with. And it's a very tough time. So I think that when things like this transpire and they happen, we have to, uh, 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 we have to bring the attention of it to the forefront. Before I hand it over to these brothers to talk about what the brother Muhammad has just said very quickly, inshallah, no more than one minute if Muhammad would allow me. The three brothers who are on this stage as, you know, someone who could be all three of their fathers. I'm not their father, I'm the older brother, the older brother. But I have mad love for all three of these brothers right here. This brother Muhammad Ba Saeed, I call him Muhammad B because he is, you know, a person who is trying to be all that he can possibly be. Something we want to see from you guys. And when he went with us recently to Lebanon, and I saw the way those Syrian children responded to his love and his rahmah for them, I was super impressed. Not to mention the fact that he's a hard worker and Allah is his hasib. So I want him to know right here now that on behalf of this masjid, we have a lot of appreciation for what he brings to the table. And then we go over to my brother, my <coughs> main man, 50 grand with the master plan, Abu Rayyan. <laughs> 20 years ago, Abu Rayyan was in the Netherlands. Never thought he would be here. Just like you guys are sitting out in that audience and you're 16, 15, and you don't know where you're gonna be in shell after 20, 25 years but we hope you'll be doing something for Al-Islam. It could be going, doing dawah, it could be something else, but you never know what the future holds for you. Abu Rayyan came to the masjid, alhamdulillah, and he steered the dawah back in a way that we're pleased with, alhamdulillah. And he knows, without saying it, I have a lot of love for him, and a lot of appreciation for what he does in this masjid and the dawah. Different dawah scenes and sets that I'm on with him, I like the way he thinks, and I want him to keep it up, inshallah. And then we have to my immediate left, 
my Habib. You guys call him Abu Taymiya. I call him Boo Taymiya. You know, like you say to your wife, hey, boo. <laughs> hey, boo, boo. Even my son, Shea Hamd, who's upstairs right now, he wakes me up and says, let's turn on the TV. I want to see Boo Taymiya. <laughs> I say, you don't want to see me? He say, nah, I want to see Boo Taymiya. That's my son. Wallahi. Seeing the trajectory and how the brother has grown and everything is very pleasing. And I want to advise him to fear Allah and to make a struggle and make jihad against his nafs. Because it's my personal opinion and my humble opinion that the vast majority of people who have shown up today, a lot of them have come because they are supporters of Butaymiyyah. So you guys make dua for all three of these brothers because they are part of the puzzle to bring Islam forward. But that doesn't exclude your responsibility. Each and every one of you, you have a role to play. Each and every one of you. So get with the program. And we ask Allah by his ism al -adham to give all of us a tawfiq and help al-Islam grow. But which Islam? The correct Islam. That is based upon the kitab and the sunnah and the way Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and the rest of those companions understood it. Radhi Allah anhum ajma'in. Tafadl. Jazakallah khair, barakallah fiqh. May Allah bless you, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah for your kind words. Inshallah, um, I'll invite the other panelists if they want to give their opening uh, statement, inshallah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Honestly, um, I didn't expect uh, such a beautiful and great turnout tonight. And I first want to thank Allah. Every time we see something that makes us happy, our first reaction should be to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always thank Allah. For if it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we wouldn't be sitting here, you wouldn't be sitting here, none of this would be happening. So alhamdulillah. I praise and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for bringing us together. Bring us together in one of his houses, in a masjid. And may Allah make us among those that rahmah descends upon them, mercy descends upon them when they gather in the house of Allah like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. I'm going to keep it short and say the reason we are all here today, the reason the masjid is full, the reason you guys are listening, the reason our beautiful panelists and brothers and shuyukh are here, he said that we can all become better worshippers of Allah. That's why we are here. And I hope that after this session, each one of us, starting with myself, can take away something that will help you improve your prayer, help you improve your connection with Allah, gives you that energy and that zeal to learn your religion, because... This is an Iman booster. And the nature of an Iman booster is that it ends. You have to continue putting the work in. So I ask you all to listen attentively. Open your hearts. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you among those that when they hear something, they follow that which is best. Take heed, take notes, and benefit from your shuyukh and your brothers, especially our beautiful Sheikh, Sheikh Abu Taymiyyah, and of course our Ustad and teacher, Sheikh Abu Osama, Hafizahullah. Without uh, taking too much longer, I also want to genuinely thank the brothers that are here, the Shaykh that are here. Thank you for coming, and may Allah accept it from us and forgive our shortcomings. Ameen. الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا. When I went to Masjid al Nur today and I saw how many of the shabab came out, I said the following to all of the attendees and I'm going to say it again here. والله brothers and I heard also there is a huge number of sisters who have turned up. The fact that you have sacrificed your enjoyment, your Friday night, in order to come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
it is honestly something that is so, so heartwarming. And as the Sheikh mentioned, something that you should all be commended for. We know so many of the Shabab, what they are doing on Friday nights, brothers. It's heartbreaking, right? Whether it may be clubbing, whether it may be discoing, whether it may be just getting together, not up to any good. So to see the masjid, I don't think I've personally ever seen the masjid this packed before. To see all of you youngsters attending, wanting to benefit, it really, really shows that there is goodness in every single one of your hearts. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the bottom of my heart to keep every single one of you guys firm upon being upright, upon that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially in today's day and age, we have Islam being attacked from all different angles. There's an ideological attack. You'd expect that the masajid would be fardy, would be empty. But the fact that you all came, it really, really shows that there is still a lot of khair, a lot of good in the Muslim ummah, especially people of Birmingham. We call it Birmingham Sharif. I would never move to Birmingham, but I always say if I want an Iman boost, I'd go to Coventry Road, right? So uh, may Allah Azza wa Jal bless every single one of you guys. Birmingham has really, really turned up today. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make this something that continues and not just as a one-off. Barakallah feekum. To answer the question very briefly, the first question, so we'll get into the program. What is a sin? A sin is that thing which is in contradiction to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As it relates to our father Adam, the first sin was approaching the tree that Allah told him, La taqraba hadihi shajara. Don't go towards this tree. Don't go close to it. Then it said, don't eat from it. It said, the ayat, the command was, don't go to it, close to it. So the sin is when the person or the creation, in the case of Iblis, who was told to bow down to Adam, fa'aba was stakbara. He was arrogant and he refused, so he made a sin. So it's called the dhamd, it's called a khata, a person can make a mistake, but it's a sin. A khatiya, it's a sin, it's a mistake. Ma'asiya is disobedience. Taqseer, he's supposed to do something, but he doesn't do it enough, or he doesn't do it the best that he should or he could. All of those, tandariju, tahtism, adham, so on, sin, all of those things. So the sin is, generally speaking, that thing or those things which are in conflict and contradiction to what Allah is pleased with and what Allah has commanded. And may Allah Ta'ala protect us from our dhunub and our ma'asi. Allahumma ameen. I didn't want to um, expand further, inshallah, we'll move on to the next question. The next question, inshallah Ta'ala. is why have we become comfortable with sins to the extent they don't mean as much as they used to compared to the time of the Salaf? Rather, now, sins are glorified. Sins are overlooked and are not seen as anything major, whether they are the big sins or the small sins. Tafadda. Alhamdulillah, salatu salamu ala rasulillah. When you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, you can't help but compare their state and how they were to how we are today. And when we do that, we see that we are failing miserably as it relates to being good worshippers. Now, Sin is being glorified. Sin is being glorified because we live in a world where the, your average Muslim is exposed to a lot of sin and many of those sins are being committed by people that aren't believers. So when you look at sin and dhunub, you have the, the, the things that the kuffar are doing and then you have the Muslims that are following those kuffar. And constant exposure to sin will lead for you to normalize it. 
And when that started becoming normalized, speaking out against it, speaking out against it, is considered something strange. So, I'll give you guys a very simple example. You go outside, you see a woman that is uncovered. Can you imagine Sayyidina Umar and Abu Bakr seeing that? How they would react to that? You see someone that is lying. Another that his whole income is based on haram. You know my cousin is a drug dealer, for example. Someone says that. It's not my actual cousin, it's an example, guys. You know? <laughs> so you, 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 you are surrounded with sin. You, each one of us, you know, let, let, me, let me do an experiment here. Raise your hand if you know someone that is Muslim that doesn't pray. Raise your hand and be honest. Raise your hand. That is way too many hands. But that shows you what? Knowing someone that doesn't pray is normal. A sister that doesn't wear hijab is normal. Raise your hand if you know someone that listens to music. Again. So, we all already know sin it has been, been made normal. Now, how often, now let me ask you this question. Raise your hands if you know someone or if you see on a regular basis someone speaking out. I'm not talking about shuyukh and lectures and sermons in the for Friday, no. I'm talking about the regular people like you speaking out against sin. How often do you see that? You see a lot, a lot less hands all of a sudden. What, that, what you just described here, and I'm so, sisters, I'm sure you guys will have the same uh, issue, is that we're seeing a lot of sin. Nothing is countering it. Nothing is. That will lead to the normalization when you have generations like yourself growing up seeing this. So, sin is being glorified because the shaitan makes it beautiful. لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانَ أَعْمَالَهُمْ The shaitan has made their misdeeds beautiful for them. So you have the shaitan on one hand doing the work that he does. And then you have the people that are perpetuating and continuing being sinful. And you have everyone else quiet. Everyone else quiet. So what we need to bring back is speaking out against sin. Because when truth appears, falsehood goes. So, sin is being glorified. Let's start glorifying worship. Let's start praising ibadah and calling towards it. Let's normalize hijab. When some sisters are normalizing, being dressed in provocative ways, we need sisters putting the hijab on. The right way. When we see people that are not praying in workplaces, we need brothers like yourselves asking for prayer rooms in college, at school, in the workplace. We need the masjid packed like this. We need to start telling our family members, fix up, change. Give the deen voice because we have no other prophets coming. And you know the shuyukh, Abu Taymi will not come to your house. It's your job to take the da'wah there. So, sin is being glorified. We see it everywhere. You see it. I see it. We all see it. This is a fact that is happening because shaitan is doing his work and things are going to get worse. There's no time except it's going to get worse. The Prophet said so until Isa comes back. So, we need to fulfill our jobs. Which means number one, work on yourself. Protect yourself from the sin. Lower your gaze. Fear Allah. Have good friends. All the advice that I'm sure the Mashaykh will be telling you but I just want to just change your mindset on one thing. The sins are not going to go away. The people will continue sinning. We need to stop promoting, glorifying, speaking about repentance. Brothers and sisters, wallahi, you can change. You can become better. You can stop praying. You can start learning your deen. You can become the believer you were meant to be. We need to start glorifying that. And that can be done when all of us are doing it collectively, inshallah ta'ala. So although it is negative and sin is being glorified, there is something that we can do about it when we start doing Amr bil aruf al-Nahi al munkar and becoming better people. I'll pass it on to the brothers to continue, inshallah. If I can just <coughs> add to what Sheikh Mustafa mentioned. My brothers and my sisters, in today's day and age, we are seeing something that has never been seen before. 
for a very long time our parents would say Muhammad stay away from this guy I think that's what they say right stay away from this guy I'm trying I'm trying stay away from this guy if you hang around with the drug dealer he's going to leave an effect on you صح? for a very long time Right? And we know the hadith, الرجل على دين خليله فلينظر أحدكم أن يخالد You are upon the religion of your friend. We know the hadith of the blacksmith and also the perfume seller. I'm sure every single individual here has heard it. إنما مثل جليس الصالح وجليس السوك حب Up until the end of the hadith. However, brothers and sisters, that's not the only thing that is going to affect our conduct and our behavior anymore. There was once upon a time a parent would say, Alhamdulillah, my daughter is at home. She doesn't go out hanging around with the fasiqat, the transgressors, those who dress prov provocatively. She doesn't hang around with them anymore. Right? She's at home. She must be great, doing well. Likewise, my son doesn't hang around with the drug dealers. He's at home. However, my brothers and my sisters, thinking that one hanging around with the wrong crowd is the only thing that is going to influence his behavior and this is only the only thing that's going to change him these days are long gone these days are long gone because a young child may be at home inside of them four walls because of what they keep on looking at this has a huge impact a huge impact on the way they begin to behave I have moms calling me saying why on earth does my daughter want to dress like uh, someone who goes out with a miniskirt? Why? I don't wear it. Her other sisters don't wear it. I'll tell you guys why it is. Because she's sitting on apps like TikTok, on Instagram, constantly flicking through these videos and becoming desensitized to it. What you keep on looking at will have a huge impact on the way you think, on the way you behave. You know, subhanAllah, I came across a statement the other day of Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he said, مُخَالَطَةُ الْعُقَلَاءِ يُقَوِّي العقل. Mixing with the people of intelligence, it will better your intellect. It will strengthen it. And then he said, مُخَالَطَةُ السُّفَهَا يُضَعِفُ العقل. Hanging around with the foolish, what does it do to your intellect? It weakens it. We're not even hanging around with them anymore. We are watching them. Now we was having a discussion with the youngsters. May Allah Azza wa reward all these youngsters who turn up today in huge numbers. And we were speaking about these YouTubers. Did you know, my brothers and my sisters, right? That in 2019, 3,000 youngsters were interviewed. And they were asked what they want to become. Guess what it was? In the USA and also in the UK. We want to become YouTubers and vloggers. They want to become like Logan Paul, KSI and all these other individuals who are extremely, extremely foolish. The next generation wants to become like them. Huh? Logan Paul comes out and he puts on a crocodile uh, costume, right? And everyone's watching, ah, looking, feeling great about it, entertained by it. We're spending hours watching these things and it's affecting the way we think. You're constantly looking through what? These videos of individuals wearing extremely filthy clothing. Don't be surprised that all of a sudden you see yourselves dressing like them because that's all you see. You're going to become influenced by what you keep on looking at. So what is the solution? My brothers and my sisters, don't look at what I'm about to tell you as extreme. Wallahi, it's something that is possible. If you feel like there is a certain app that is affecting your mental health or your spirituality, cut it off today. We lived for ages without these social media apps. And now it is increasing our depression. It is affecting our mental health. It is affecting our confidence. Right? It is affecting our morale in so many different ways because of what we keep on looking at. When you think about it, a lot of the sins that we're falling into is because of what you saw. Agreed? Because of what we keep on looking at. Barakallah fikum. Zakallah khair. The next question, inshallah ta'ala, is what are the consequences of a person who openly sins? Openly sins. And that may be out in front of people 
or whatever sin they're involved in, they're posting it on their social media accounts. Further on. Concerning people who openly sin, the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the famous hadith, told us that all of his ummah will be forgiven, except for the mujahireen. The mujahireen are the people who openly sin. The hadith said that the person makes a sin at nighttime, meaning people didn't know that he or she did it, but then they wake up after Allah gave them the sitter and they come out, and then they say, hey, fulan, I did this and I did that and I did that. I did this and I did that. So as a result of broadcasting that, the jaza for that issue is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't forgive that individual. And Allah azza wa jal forgives all sins except shirk. He's arham ar-rahimin. But there's a compounded problem when the person does it in public because that encourages other people to sin. And then it brings another issue to the table and that is Anyone and everyone who has something to do with aiding and abetting a sin in public and it being done in public, they'll be responsible for those people who work by that sin. And that's why when it comes to this issue of social media, some of us, a lot of us, and I think most of us and Allah knows best, we don't really take our time to really think, should I send this thing out? But because we see it and we find it funny interesting, amazing, and it can be anything. It could be a sin, it could be something that we shouldn't glorify like people getting killed and things like that. A person can send something to someone and not know that the person who watches that thing can be effect, affected by it in a very negative way, like a pregnant woman losing her child. That's, pro that's possible. That a pregnant woman can look at something and it shocks her, and as a result of that, it causes the baby to come out. Some people may think that that is extreme, but that's not extreme in Al-Islam because the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you see a certain type of snake, then you should kill that snake on sight because that snake can cause a woman's child to be aborted. Last thing that I would mention is that open sins, they incur the curse of Allah on people and the destruction of everybody. Prophet told about the time when the Mahdi is going to come, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the people are going to go out in order to make money from the people who are supporting the Mahdi. They all go out in public. Their niyyah is not to support the Mahdi. They just want to make money. They just want to get some benefit in the dunya. But because Allah Azawajal is going to punish the people who are against the Mahdi, those people who went out to support and the people who just went to make money and to get paid and get some benefit, the adab, amma bihim jami'a, it fell on all of them. And when our mother heard this hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she said, Ya Rasulullah, will the righteous people be destroyed as well? The innocent and the righteous? He said, yes, they'll be destroyed as well. And then Allah will raise everybody up based upon his niyyah. So the ones who are the criminals, they'll be raised up Yom al Qiyamah, dealing with the recompense of the sin. But the people who were in society and the sin spread like that, they'll lose their lives as a result of that. So the end result of the sin is multifaceted. That's why we all have a religious obligation to do the best that we can to try to give dawah and to make inkar upon what we see and not to help the situation perpetuate. Uh, brothers and sisters, can I ask you all a question? I really want you guys to reflect on this. If you've put out a certain video on your social media, or my sister, you have put out a picture of yourself not wearing the hijab or dressing appropriately, what if you die tomorrow? Think about that for a moment. What if you die tomorrow? No one has your passwords. Who's going to take it off? Right? This is a serious thing to really take into consideration. And remember, this is going to multiply. Everyone that's seeing it, right? Everyone that's seeing it, that's sinning. And you were the cause of that sin. It is all being what? Added on your scale of bad deeds. We all hear about, you know, giving da'wah. 
you teach this to so and so, it multiplies when he goes in, teaches someone else. The ilm that you're leaving behind, the legacy, the sins are very similar, my brothers and my sisters. Right? It multiplies. You're in your grave. Let me share a dream that my wife had. Of course, we don't take our religion, huh? you know, um, you know, dreams are not like ahkam, rulings, and whatever have you, if that makes sense. Even though dreams have a significance in our religion. Especially at the end of times, the Messiah told us, it is from the most truthful of things that you will come across. Right? And it's from the portions of Nubuwa. My wife, she saw a good friend of hers from back in the day, in a dream after she passed away. In the dream, she looked extremely weak. Right? And she was coming up to her, hugging her and she looked in turmoil, brothers. She looked very, very saddened. So, subhanAllah, this was a big bother for my family. And she asked me, what do you think it is? So we just started brainstorming. And then she realized that she has some of her pictures out on the World Wide Web. So she decided to get in touch with the family. When she got in touch with the family, saying that if you could remove maybe some of these pictures, it could be that this is going to harm her in her grave. In the beginning, they were very skeptical. Eventually, they removed it. Months later, she sees another dream. And in the dream, she looked a lot better, saying thank you. Right? Think about this, my brothers and my sisters. I'm not saying that this is a hukum shar'i, that this is a ruling that's come down in 2022. I think everybody gets the gist here. They have consequences, right? We sometimes look at the sin being extremely light. Everyone is doing it, my brothers and my sisters. You know what Ibn Qayyim says? Al Ma'asiyah, the sin that we fall into, is Baridul Kufur. It is the first spark that leads to disbelief. The first spark. Kama anna al Qublata, Baridul Zina. Just like the kiss. You know when you kiss? It is the first spark to a zina. One thing leads to another. We shouldn't be surprised that someone just randomly leaves the fold of Islam. I don't believe it just randomly happens. One thing leads to another. Right? It's from the Sheikh. I just remember the story about someone openly sinning, involving other people, and the consequences that had. So, <clears throat> someone had an account to these filthy adult content websites. He shared it with some of his friends. Pays money for this. This brother died without repenting. They buried him. After they buried him, he went home. He received an email. And he was still getting those messages after he died. He's in the grave. And that sin is continuing. Every time that you do a sin and you're not ashamed enough to keep it to yourself, it's only a problem that you're sinning. That you don't care about the angels writing. That you don't care about Allah seeing you. But to have the audacity to involve others, to post online. You'll see people, they go clubbing, they take videos, they post it online. As they, if they want to relive the sin. There will be a time, each one of us will have to relive your sins. Read them. Allah will put it in front of us. The scribes have written it. And on the day of judgment, we will see it. Now we live at, a, at an age where we are doing the account ourselves. We are keeping track of our own sins ourselves. I'll give you guys advice. If you want to know how your scribe and what the angels are writing looks like, look at your social media feed, look at your internet history, look at what you have been posting, look at that. That's what they're writing. That's what the angels are. That's what you're going to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. And if you're not happy with that, you better delete anything that you put out in the world that doesn't please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Delete it immediately. Lest you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those sins. And the other thing that I want to add, and this is really important, you're harming other people. 
Someone puts up a video on TikTok or on Instagram or anywhere, and in it, they're doing something that's haram or saying something that is haram or showing something that is haram, whatever the case is, whatever it is, every time you, someone watches that, first, you were the cause of someone else sinning now. You put that in front of them. And you're also continuing your sin. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, this is why we need to be much more careful now because lies and sins. By the way, when we say sins, don't only think about images and videos and haram websites. No, 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 no. A lie that you say online. That you perpetuate. Right. Nowadays, we make a meme out of someone and this is normal. Some funny clip, someone doing something, they were not okay with that, and we send it everywhere. On the day of judgment, that person that was not happy to be mocked like that, would he not ask Allah subhanahu Ya Allah, look at what this person did. How they mocked me. Tweet, quote, tweet, share, like, laugh at it. Wallahi, it's dangerous. My brothers, wallahi, Instagram, TikTok, social media, it's extremely dangerous for your akhirah. It's extremely, every like, Share that you do, Allah will ask you about it. Did you like and share that which is pleasing to Allah? Or did you like and share and subscribe to that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When you subscribe to pages that have filthy content, haram content in, you're supporting them, Allah will ask you about it. Allah will ask you about it. You're not allowed to do that. So my brothers, the advice I want to give you is, when you start, and I said this somewhat, uh, a while back as well, it seems like different rules apply when we're online. Things you wouldn't say to someone face to face, behind the screen you will say. Things you wouldn't do in front of people, behind the screen you will do. Same rules don't apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should fear Allah wherever you are. So let's fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not be among those. The one group, the one group, Allah said, or the Prophet said, their sins are not forgiven. Those that are boastful about them, they don't care about them, they have to show it to everyone. Don't be among those people. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of us. I'm sorry if I took too long to answer that question. Barakallahu feekum. Allah khair. Next question, inshallah, is are those who sin in private better than those who sin in public? And how do we overcome a public or a private sin? As for the question, those who sin in private, are they better than those who sin in public? First of all, this is a detailed answer. But let me tell everybody here, and we always have to struggle to be in the middle, the sirat al-mustaqim, in all of our affairs. The way we understand these kinds of issues, we can't be polarized on either side of the pole because there are details. But for everybody here, Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَلَوْ يُؤَاخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسِ بِمَا كَسَبُوا If Allah were to take them and make everybody responsible for what they've done, مَا تَرَكَ عَلَيْهَا مِنْ دَابَّتُمْ وَلَكِنْ يُؤَاخِرُهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجْلٍ مُسَمَّى Allah wouldn't leave a single person on the face of the earth, not a single person here, and outside of this masjid. That's why you have to be careful of going overboard in sheikhs and personalities because everybody's making sins. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, all of Adam's children make sins. The sheikh and the malvi sab and the speakers, everybody makes sins. So never put yourself in a position where you get it conflated and confused. Respecting the sheikh is one thing, but putting him up where you think he's flying around with the malaika is a problem. So Allah has informed us, everybody is sinning. But the question is, how are we sinning? As for those who sin in private, generally speaking, that's easier. That's a khaf, that's lighter, but not all the time. A person who commits zina in private, does murder in private, does a sin where there's corporal capital punishment. And then the person outside, he does a sin. He smokes, he drinks in public. He does something, it's a sin. We're not going to say that the sin that was done in public is greater than the sin where a person can lose his life or corporal punishment is put on him. But generally speaking, generally speaking, the sin done in, done in private, one of the names of Allah Ta'ala is a satir, 
الستر Allah covers up and he loves he loves in a way that befits his majesty he loves for people to cover each other up and to cover themselves up so if a person does a sin in private usually speaking it's a khaf it's a khaf but it depends on what the sin is so there's no general rule the sin in private is better than the sin in public or lesser in degree la situation is not like that and Allah is a'la and a'lam. Brothers and sisters, can we stop looking at how small the sin is and focus more on the greatness of who we are disobeying? There's a narration that has been attributed to one of the companions that's completely crossed my mind now. إِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْمَلُونَ أَعْمَالًا هِيَ أَدَقُّ فِي عَيُنِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّعْرِ وَكُنَّا نَعُدُّهَا مِنَ الْمُوبِقَاتِ One of the companions was speaking to those around him. He's a companion. He witnessed the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking wahi coming down upon him. He said, you are going to be doing actions. Right? You see it so lightly, lighter than a thin piece of hair. And we used to consider it to be from the Mubiqat, Ayy Al-Muhlikat, the destructive sins. Don't look at how small the sin is. Like I said earlier, one thing leads to another. Right? It is Barid al Kufr, it's the first spark to disbelief, eventually shooting out of the religion. Also, this narration, I believe, is attributed to Abdullah Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, or maybe it's Marfu' as well. Right? Inna al Mu'mina, yara dhunubahu ka'annahu ka'idun tahta al jabal, yakhafu an yaka alayh. The believer, he sees his sins as if he's sitting under a mountain, fearing that the mountain is going to drop onto him. That's how big he sees it. Right? When we have that kind of thought process, we will think thrice, my brothers and my sisters. The more you learn about Allah Azza wa Jal, the more you will think about what you are carrying out when it comes to the sins. This is why Talab al-ilm, seeking knowledge is extremely important. Sometimes someone calls me and he says, Brother, I don't feel that connection because we're not learning. We're not taking out our time from our time, you know, to really just learn about Allah Azza wa Jal. When you come to know about a certain individual, right, and you begin to love him, you love him because the more things you know about him, right? Likewise, when you go and ask for a sister's hand in marriage, you came to know that she's this and she's that and she's that. I'm not trying to compare them to Allah Azza wa Jal, but the more you learn about something, the more it begins to uh, cause you to love that. So you have to learn your religion and perhaps maybe then we will think thrice the moment we are about to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. I just want to add a few words because we're talking about sinning we must also talk about repentance and the importance that you understand how often you need to be repenting and how you should be repenting um, sinning publicly, sinning privately we are all sinning and this is something that's going to happen some of us have engaged in sin today, tomorrow we will. This is a fact. But not all of us will be repenting. That's key. You need to repent from your sins. Now, the steps of repentance are as follows. Genuine regret. Genuine regret. You have to feel sorry. You have to feel bad. I disobeyed my creator. I did this thing that I wasn't supposed to do. Right? I'm alhamdulillah, I'm enjoying my life, my health, my family. Allah has blessed me with so many things and I chose to disobey him. Come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Feel regret. If you don't feel regret, if you feel you don't care, la mubala, you don't care, or even worse, you're proud, then Allah will not accept your repentance. So you must feel remorse. Secondly, you must remove yourself from that sin. You can't still be engaged in that sin and seeking Allah's repentance. You have to stop it. Whatever that is that you're doing. If it was a relationship, you end it. If it was a subscription to an account, you close it. If it was whatever it is, if you're selling something you're selling, you stop. You remove yourself from the sin or else Allah will not accept your repentance. And finally, you decide. You make a firm decision to never go back to it again. Now, it may be you go back to it tomorrow. 
But today you make a firm decision that you'll never do it again. If shaitan overwhelms you, if you become weak, so be it. But now, for Allah to accept your repentance, you make that decision. And then what do you do after a week, two weeks, if you fall into sin again? Rinse and repeat. Remorse. Remove yourself. And decide to never do it again. And Allah will accept your repentance. How long do we continue this? Until the day we die. Don't stop because the shaitan will never stop influencing you. I want to also focus one more point on the concept of repentance because we need to understand it. You have an opportunity every time you sin to make Allah happy. Every time you sin, you have an opportunity to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. How happy? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tried to describe to us the epitome, the highest form of happiness. Highest form. And he gave a description of a man. This man is traveling in the desert by himself. He has a camel and the camel is carrying his food and water. He loses his food and water and his camel. He takes a nap, he rests, he can't find it. He runs and runs and runs and runs. And he knows he, if he can't find his camel that is carrying his food and water, he will most definitely die. Until he gives up. Who knows how long he's been looking, he finally gives up. Gets, knows, khalas, I am going to die a horrible death because it's going to be out of thirst and hunger. Imagine the despair, the anguish, the worry. And khalas, he gives up. He falls asleep, he wakes up, and the camel with the water and the food is right there in front of him. The joy that person feels, is that normal joy? Is that, I don't think I've ever felt that happy. I don't think I've ever felt so happy that my life was... The Prophet described the highest form of happiness someone can feel. And then he grabbed the leash on the camel and was so happy. He said, oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. What was he meant to say? Oh Allah, you are my and I am your. He was so happy he didn't know what he was saying. Did that ever happen to you? You got so happy you didn't know what you were saying? That doesn't happen to most people. That is the most extreme form of happiness, is it not? And the Prophet said, Allah is more happier than that man. Allah is more happy than that man when one of you repents. Can you imagine? Right now, right now, if you repent from a sin you did this morning, and you follow those three steps, that's how happy you made Allah. That's how much Allah loves us. Allah loves us so much that for you to just come back from your sin, Allah becomes that happy. Wallah, your parents will not become that happy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you that much. And I'll tell you one more thing, and I, uh, this is going too long, I'll tell you one more thing. You know that initial regret that you feel? The initial regret when you do something wrong and you want to change? Raise your hand if you ever felt that. Raise your hand if you ever felt that. You know who put that in your heart? Allah puts that in your heart. It didn't come from you. Allah put that in your heart. ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا Allah put it in their hearts and nadam and the need to repent. Allah puts it in your heart because Allah loves you. Then you go through those steps and Allah accepts your repentance and is that happy. The point I'm trying to say is is Allah not deserving of our love? Is Allah not deserving of our love? If Allah is like that with his servant that is sinning, how do you think Allah is with his servant that worships him? Barakallahu feekum. Barakallahu khair. Next question, inshallah ta'ala. What are the signs of becoming more interested in the attention of others, seeking the attention of others, rather than the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this um, time that we're living in, the, the time in the era of the millennials, and someone up here <laughs> said that this was the worst time because of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he described these times as the times of deceit, the years of deceit. What is up is not really up, and what is down is not really down. What's tawheed is not really tawheed. What's the sunnah is not the sunnah. 
the trustworthy person and all that stuff like that. So doing this era is the me, myself, and I era. It's how I feel. It's about me. So your parents are not perfect. I'm a parent and I'm not perfect. But we're living in an era now where the kid is on that minhaj of me, myself, and I, and he doesn't appreciate what his father does for him and what his mother does for him. He says, it's me, me, me. I want this, I want that. What about how I feel? So it's a era in which the person is worried about himself. So when he does something, he wants people to acknowledge him. And he wants people to praise him. And you know that that's your near from many things. I just mentioned a few here. But before doing it, inshallah, we should know this is one of the characteristics of the Yahud. Yuhibbuna and yuhmadu ala ma'alim yaf'alu. They love to be praised for what they didn't do. They love that. For what they didn't do. They love people to acknowledge them and recognize and point fingers at. Look what I've done. And you really didn't do anything. The other thing is that the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, out of all of the things to be afraid of for this ummah, a dajjal, so many things. He said, the thing that I'm most fearful of happening to this ummah is people showing off. People showing off. And if a person believes, like anyone on this stage, if anyone on this stage believes that he doesn't have to make jihad enough, Rasulullah was afraid for that concern in his companions. They were the only of Allah. And we're not going to be afraid. La wallahi, it's an issue. Especially with the internet. Especially with views. That's just how it is. So sometimes one of the things that I found out during this time, if you want more views and this whole science about algorithms, then throw your hat into the arena of a situation that's famous and you're going to get views. You see a brother from amongst those who are calling to Al-Islam and he gets 100,000 views, 200,000 views, a million views. And there are people who see that and they also give dawah. They say, damn, why you get all them views? And you guys laugh, inshallah, you laugh. You have brothers and friends who are around you who don't want to see good for you. And they're supposed to be your homies. They're supposed to be your sister. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that every ni'mah that Allah gave you, there's someone who's jealous of that ni'mah. That's everybody here. So as it relates to this issue of is your niya to be praised? Is your niya so that people can acknowledge you? One of the signs of that is when people criticize you, do you get real upset? All right, when they praise you, you get off on that and you're real happy. And sometimes that's okay because as human beings, the Nabi taught us that you have to praise your children. He said, Ni'mar Raju Abdullah bin Umar. You're a good man. Abu Bakr is in Jannah. Umar is in Jannah. Uthman is in Jannah. Ali is in Jannah. That's a way of giving them encouragement. We can't be people. You are bum. You never we can't be like that. So you need that thing where people are praising you. But the point here is, from what I want to mention is, when people criticize you, that's one of the ways that you make yourself better. So you can read those comments for an example, and I don't. And I do not encourage people. You have, to have, you have to have tough skin. Don't pay attention to those comments. Because there are people who troll you. There are people who majnoon. They are kofar. They are a jinn. They are a jinn on the comments, man. You think I'm going to respond to everybody that has a comment? No. If the comment is true in its place, then leave it up. Leave it up so that the people can see you're one of those people who you can be criticized. Don't be one of those people who just you want those comments up that are positive. So one of the ways is you can know if people praise you and people criticize you. Both of them are the same for you. They're the same. And I know a lot of you young brothers are athletes and you're into athleticism. I'm not into soccer, into football, but I know for a fact from the, from the sports that I was into in America, even right now, all of those athletes who are at the top of their games, not a single one of them exists except he has a trainer there, a trainer to teach him fundamentals, 
a trainer to tell them, you have to do this. A trainer to tell them, you're doing it wrong, you're compromising this. That is the importance of nasiha and giving advice. No one would deny that. No one would reject that. No one here. But when it comes to the religion, we look at the nasiha that comes from people when it's the truth as being an attack on us. Don't take it like that. Don't take it as an attack. Take people's criticism the same way you take their praise. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you take them equally so that when they praise you, you don't go overboard. He's a fanboy. No matter what Butamia says, they're going to say, that was the greatest talk I ever heard in my life. And then his enemy is going to say, he's the most ignorant person that I've ever seen on the face of the earth. Because that's the gulu of people. So just stay in the middle. That's what we do. If you want to make Allah's Rajal your goal and objective, your hedef, then when people praise you and people criticize you, let it be one and the same. Because your goal and your objective and your need is to uh, please Allah and not the people. You know, it's a common question that people tend to ask, how do I know if I'm being sincere? Right? Am I being sincere when I post this? Am I being sincere when I tweet this? Right? People always ask this question. My brothers and my sisters, the guideline here and the toji is that you always ask yourself before you post it, am I doing it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal or am I interested in the views? Right? Or while you are maybe recording or writing, are you still doing it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal? Because sometimes the shaitan whispers, brothers and sisters, maybe rephrase that so it can become a very nice Instagram reel. The struggle is real, brothers. Wallahi al-Azim. And then also after you finish with that act, ask yourself, do I really do it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal? And as long as you are continuously striving against your nafs, inshallah ta'ala is a good sign. Right? I'm going to share the statement of Sulaiman bin Dawood al-Hashimi who lived in the same time as Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi. He even said about him, يصلح أن يكون خليفة المسلمين. Right? He is intelligent enough to become the Khalifa of the Muslims. He said, ربما وحدث بحديث ولينية. Imagine now brothers, a hadith, one hadith. Let's just take the hadith of Jibreel as an example. How many lines is it? 10, 11? He says, when I start narrating the hadith, I have a particular intention. And then I might come to maybe what the fifth line and my intention now begins to change. Sometimes that happens. You're giving a reminder, more people start walking in, right? And the shaitan is whispering, start impressing them by quoting X, Y, and Z. You're still battling with your nafs. Does that make sense? And then he says, وَرُبَّ Perhaps maybe one hadith, it requires multiple intentions. What hadith? Let alone a whole lecture. Or you may be spending an hour with your friend trying to advise him. Allahu A'lam what the intention might be and how the intention may end up changing. Right? It's a struggle. It's a double-edged sword, social media, videos and whatever have you. However, always asking yourself before, while you're doing that act and also after, am I doing it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal? Right? I, I just want to add uh, two points. One of them is <clears throat> someone that I, I greatly respect. I've seen him, an exercise that he does. He reminds himself to check his intention. He reminds himself to check his intention. So like uh, Sheikh Abu Taymi said right now, remind yourself often and renew your intention. Now, for you, it may be what you're putting online, but it could be your other ibadat as well. Your prayer, your zakat, when you're going for umrah, all of this, always renew your intention. I am doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am doing this to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And make sure it's always about Allah. You and Allah. Because one day you'll be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you need the reward. Don't ruin your reward by having the wrong intention. So keep renewing your intention for everything that you do. Tajdeedun niyyah. Just like sometimes we do tajdeedun wudu, we renew our wudu, renew your intention. Remind yourself over and over again the real reason that you're doing it. 
And if you find yourself that maybe you're doing it for, then work on it. Then work on it. Don't leave the act of worship. Some people, it becomes waswas. I have seen some people, they, they say, Shaykh, uh, I'm not sure if my salah was for the sake of Allah. I'm not sure, shall I leave it? Listen, do the good deeds, keep doing them, but just work on your intentions, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask Allah to accept it from you as well. Ask Allah to accept it from you before and after because what is the point of all of these good deeds if Allah doesn't accept it from you? So keep making that dua, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakallah khair. Next question, inshallah ta'ala. And um, I might expand on this uh, by asking our panelists uh, specifically. But for now, it is a general question to the, the whole panel. How do we remain firm with acts of worship for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or even staying away from sin? Certainly staying, staying firm in acts of work, worship, you have to understand, you have to believe you can never be firm. Who in his right mind can believe that he's doing something that Allah has accepted? That's why Allah told us in the Quran and prohibited that. لا تزكوا انفسكم هو أعلم بمن اتقى Don't praise yourselves. I'm firm. What are you talking about? Allah knows the best who's firm. You may do something, but because of something that's going on, it doesn't get accepted. And in addition to that, look at those companions. They didn't exist like that. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Abu Bakr, who's the best human being after the prophets and the messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa ajma'in, he said about his tongue, this tongue of mine, awradani and mahalik, it has put me in situations where I could be destroyed. That's Abu Bakr, where you're not going to find a hadith where he's making, you know, sins and making, no. He's a wali from the only of Allah. Ibrahim, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, made dua to Allah to save him and his children, who were from the Anbiya, from worshiping idols, because those idols have led a lot of people astray. So I'm going to talk about I'm firm. Nobody is firm. If you exist like that, you have a ghurur. Something is wrong with you. And I admit people like that. We have a lot of them. May Allah protect us from that. Say I mean, The Muslims who believe, you know, like in soccer and football, a ref pull out the card, red card, yellow card, get off the pitch. There are people from amongst us like that. You're not religious enough to pass my grade. Who are you? Who are you? We're trying to pass Allah's. Allah, the way he looks at us, not you. So therefore, the people of the Sunnah, the people of Islam, our existence, as I told you, is in the middle, inshallah. Now I'm firm. We exist between the wing of hope. I hope that Allah accepts it from me, my ibadah. I hope he accepts what I'm doing here right now. But I'm afraid he's not going to accept it. I'm afraid he's not going to accept it. And that's how we exist. So after you do what you do, you keep asking Allah, hey, please, Allah, please accept it. As for that, that existence, I'm here and I'm firm. No one does that except that individual. That person is destroyed. He's on the path and the madhab of, 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 of being destroyed. May Allah save us from that and just give us the balance. I'm afraid that Allah won't accept it from me. But I hope He'll have mercy upon me and accept it from me. Although he accepts it, it may not even deserve to be accepted. But he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, will take a deed that a person has the right near in it, and he will grow it and make it bigger than it actually was. And that's his rahmah and his fadl and his karam. You know, my brothers and my sisters, what I've seen over the years, and it breaks my heart, I've seen a lot of brothers go to the University of Medina. They dropped out, they came back, and they turned out to be drug dealers. You know what I put it down to? al ghurur as the Sheikh was mentioning. Sometimes you embrace this kind of da'wah. Someone exposes you to the da'wah of following the Qur'an and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf. And when we say Salaf, we mean the three golden generations. The Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Tabi'ul Tabi'een. And one begins to feel as if he has a 
green card to enter into Al Jannah, brothers and sisters. Be very, very careful. And that's extremely, extremely common here in Birmingham. You should fear for yourself, no matter what you have embraced when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran, Sunnah, the way of the companions is good, but still we have to work all the way up until we meet Allah Azza wa Jal. To think that you have now a green card to enter into Al Jannah, you are gravely, gravely mistaken, as the Shaykh mentioned. We worship Allah between hope and fear. Right? You still have to keep on going. You learnt a couple of things here and there, and then you start labeling people. Right? You begin to think that everyone خلاص, is destroyed except you and maybe some of your friends. And the Messenger وسلم, told us. Man qala halak al nas, whoever says now everyone khalas is destroyed, he is the worst of them. Right? So I've seen brothers being extremely rough and tough, walking around as if they are the vanguards of Al Jannah. And I would try to advise them, Wallahi min Babi Shafiqa, please akhi. And I'll be laughed at, I'll be ridiculed in Al Medina. What I fear for you is that you might end up leaving the religion or you might fall off. Be balanced at least while you are at the beginning of seeking knowledge. Remain calm. Many brothers left, brothers and sisters. And then I hear about, oh, this guy is maybe selling drugs. This guy is hanging around with ladies, carrying out all types of filth. And that is maybe he looked at people in a very, very belittling way. Right? There are people, brothers, they may not necessarily have beards, they may not necessarily have the Islamic look, but he has a secret act between himself and Allah Azza wa Jal that he may accept from him and then he makes dua against you. It is the reason why Allah Azza wa Jal destroys you in this dunya before the hereafter. Right? And then we go around oppressing them. I just gave that as an example. That is because of a secret act that he has between himself and Allah Azza wa Jal. The fact that you know, of course, we're going to advise him to grow his beard and everything, but you guys get the point, right? Be extra, extra careful, brothers and sisters. I've seen too many people fall off. It breaks my heart. Even if he's oppressed me, the last thing I want from him is now to become a drug dealer on the streets of Birmingham. And that is because he's looking at everyone in a very, very belittling way. Fear Allah, Azza wa Jal. Don't ever walk past an individual thinking that you're better than him. Never, no matter how much you've learned, what you've embraced, who you've sat with, how many scholars you've maybe studied with, right? Um. The believers make the dua to Allah Ta'ala to establish their feet and to help them and give them sabr and to help them over the people who are disbelievers and the oppressors. The Nabi used to make sajda, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he used to ask Allah, the turn of the hearts, establish my heart on this deen. Everybody here should memorize that dua. Why would he tell us that? In sajda, the closest you are to Allah. There were people who were companions and they saw the moon split and they saw mu'jizat. They saw the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he said he went to Isra and Mi'raj and came back, some of them apostated and left the deen. When the Prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some of the people apostated and left the deen. There was a man who was a companion. He was one of the scribes. He used to write the Quran when it was revealed. That's a sign that he has amana for him to write the revelation, like Muawiyah, like Ali. If the revelation came down, Rasulullah would call him, come, come, and he would write the Quran. And he apostated from the religion. And he told the non-Muslims, you know this Quran that comes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm the one who did it. I made it up. He's a liar. When they buried that man, the earth threw him out because he was so nasty. His people came and said, look at Muhammad and his companions. They hate him so much because he exposed them. Look at it. They put him deeper. The next day they came, he was out on the ground because the earth, it doesn't like to hear Merry Christmas, doesn't like to hear, you know, statements of kufr, doesn't like that. Threw that man out three days in a row. They said, 
this is more than this is more than what we think it is. And they left him out. So the Shahid Min al Kalam, the point is, those people were with the Nabi of Islam. And that's why the Prophet praised people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who didn't meet him and didn't see him. He said, My ummah is like the rain. You don't know where the good is. Is it in the beginning of the rain or in the end of the rain? Meaning, meaning what? There are people who came and we believe in him, inshallah. We are all mu'minun, inshallah. We didn't see him, but seeing is not like hearing. And that's what the Nabi said. When Allah told Musa, your people are worshiping the calf, Musa didn't get mad like that. And he knew Allah was telling the truth. He heard that. When he went and he saw those people worshiping, he took the parchments that were revealed and threw them on the floor out of anger. The prophet said, seeing is not like hearing. We didn't see him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we believe in him. But while believing in him, you better rest assured. If some of those people who saw him and lived with him apostated, and you think that can't happen to one of us? People were saying, raise your hand for this, raise your hand for this. I don't want you to raise your hand. But some of us have performed hajj and umrah with families where the people there are apostates, atheists. And we're performing umrah, hajj. And the people with us don't believe in Allah. So don't be on that stuff about I'm firm. Ask Allah for thabat and do your best, inshallah. Do the best that you can possibly do. And we ask Allah Ta'ala and you thabitna ala deenihi with ikhlas and with al-irshad. Qulu ami. I want to briefly summarize what the two sheikhs said and also teach you a dua. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in, in a hadith that's in Muslim Ahmad, he taught a dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka thabat fil amr wal azimatu ala rushd. Oh Allah, I ask you to keep me firm on this affair. Keep me firm upon Islam. Keep me firm upon the sunnah. Don't make me deviate. Oh Allah, keep me upon the right path. Which means, give me the, the, the determination, the ability, the will to be upon guidance. What that means is, sometimes, sometimes, you know what the truth is. You know you have to wake up for salah. You know you have to go to the masjid for Jumu'ah. You know you're not supposed to do that sin. You know it. But something is stopping you. You don't have that determination. Al-Azima ala rushd To be determined to be upon guidance. So make that dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka thabat fil amr. Oh Allah, I ask you to keep me firm on this affair. Wal-Azima ala rushd And I ask you to give me the, the, the ability and determination to be upon guidance. The second thing is, what our Shaykh Abu Taymiyyah described earlier is called ujb. Self-amazement. Ujb, self-amazement. It is a sickness. It is an illness that happens to the heart. The shaitan has ways to deal with people because his job is to deviate you from the truth and ensure that you don't go to Jannah. That's his job. And if for some people he will come from the angle of sins, leave off the prayer, leave off the hijab, commit zina, hurt people. This is the thing. That's one door. The other door is when you stop all of that you start fearing Allah, you come to the masjid, you change the way you dress, you become a better believer. What happens then? Then the shaitan knows, okay, this person is getting ready for ibadah. I can't tell him to do zina anymore. Then he'll say, I'll tell him to feel good about himself. Feel good about himself. Yes. Yes, I am this, I am that. I am better. It happens. Sisters start wearing niqab. They look down on the sisters that don't. A brother comes to the masjid. He looks down on the brother that doesn't. Ya akhi. You were just like that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed this mercy upon you. It's not from you. It is very dangerous. So, the moment you start feeling good about yourself, if you're thinking, you know what? I'm a good Muslim. You know what? I'm doing great. Don't feel like that. Don't feel like that. Because that means, at the very least, you'll stagnate. You won't think about repenting and improving yourself. You start thinking, Alhamdulillah, I read one juice of Quran, two juice of Quran. How do you know Allah accepted that? So watch out for the illness. For my practicing brothers and sisters, watch out for ujb. That's what Shaykh Abu Taymiyyah, Hafidhahullah, was talking about earlier. Barakallahu feekum.
Jazakallah khair. Brothers and sisters, I don't care how the brother's hair looks. Sometimes we make people feel uncomfortable in the masjid. Just as that other, that old man has every right to be in the masjid, that drug dealer should, be, should feel comfortable walking into the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you should make him feel comfortable like that. He has every right to walk in the masjid. Last time I checked, brothers and sisters, it's called Baytullah, the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. It's not my masjid, it's not your masjid, it's not the uncle's masjid, it is the house of Allah. Everyone is welcome. If a woman doesn't wear hijab and now she wants to go and explore the masjid, should you now make her feel uncomfortable? La, you should welcome her and slowly maybe guide her. Right? Sometimes we are the cause why people are pushed away. Fatanabbah, ya ibad Allah. Right? Be careful with that. So I don't care how he looks. I don't care if he's dragging his trousers and he's not walking into the masjid. You have no right to make that brother feel uncomfortable or how big his hair has gone. Right? Sometimes you see elders looking at a guy in a very funny way. No! The house of Allah Azza wa Jal. If someone committed the most filthiest of acts outside and then he walked into the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, that is a wonderful thing that he's doing. When we look at that hadith, وَأَتْبِعِ سَيَّةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا Follow up a bad deed with a good one, right? It will erase it. Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi he talks about it being from the same type. Someone just walked into the club. What should he do? What should he follow up with? By walking into the masjid. Because he uses feet with haram. Right? So he just come out and now he wants to walk into the masjid. And then you tell him, get out. You're not welcome here. Or you make him feel that way. You give him these negative vibes. Um, sorry, Muhammad, to cut you. I just... Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Allah barik feek. When we were discussing uh, staying firm, there's a couple of things. Uh, sorry, staying firm and staying away from certain sins. There's a couple of things that you, I know you wanted to address, inshallah ta'ala, and that is staying firm and, and, and improving yourself on hijab, overcoming the wearing of makeup, and also addiction to pornography. Tawla. These are some of the main questions or the common questions that I always receive on my fitnagram, right? Yes, it's a fitnagram. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha ghayruh. The common questions, pornography, how do I overcome it? I'll come on to the other two inshallah ta'ala. My brothers and my sisters, give this a try and then send me your success story so I can quote in the next program. Enough brothers have tried it. Walillahi alhamdu wal minna. Alhamdulillah, they are in a better place. If you are addicted to a particular sin, every time you fall into that sin, get up, make wudu, pray to rakat. This is heavy on the shaitan. Every time you do it. Yes, it looks like a burden, but try it and then see where you end up. It's only a matter of time. When you keep showing Allah Azza wa Jal that I want to change, that I want to become better. Shaykh Mustafa earlier spoke about some of the conditions of Tawbah. I don't care if you've fallen into that sin a hundred times. Every time go and do it. Right? And see where you end up. It's only a matter of time, my brothers and my sisters, that inshallah ta'ala you will find yourself in a better place. Whatever secret sin it might be. Right? If also you are carrying out these secret sins, be someone who has secret acts of ibadat. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, he talks about this, right? He even brings a line of poetry in his, I believe, at Da'wa Dawa, the spiritual sickness and the cure. He says, ذُنُوبُ الْخَلَوَاتِ سَبَبٌ لِانْتِكَاسَاتِ وَعِبَادَةُ الْخَلَوَاتِ سَبَبٌ لِثَبَاتِ The dhunub, the sins that you do in private, is a big reason why you will go astray. Why you will fall off the religion. And righteous acts of worship that you do in private is a huge reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep you firm. No one knows about that two raka'at that you are now praying because of that sin. You've just followed up that private sin with a private act of worship. See what happens. Even that wudu. No one knows why you're making wudu. It's not even a salah time, right? You went into the bathroom, you made wudu and you came out and you're praying two raka'at in your room. Right? Also try to go through some of the effects of sins, brothers and sisters. There's a kitab called the Da'wa Dawa. 
the spiritual sickness and its cure. Our Shaykh Abdul Zakh al Badari taught us this kitab in the Prophet's masjid. It honestly changed my perspective in how I look at problems. It really, really has. Right? It lists the effects of sins. One of them is, my brothers and my sisters, right? That you're going to drop in the eyes of the people. Did you know that? When you carry out sins in private and you have a very good reputation in the eyes of the people, or maybe in your community, or in your family, right? You do these private sins, all of a sudden you dropped. Why? Because of the private sins. Ibn al-Jawzi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he said, رَأَيْتُ أَخْوَامًا مِنْ مُنْتَسِبِينَ إِلَى الْعِلْمِ أَهْمَلُوا نَظَرَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَ فِي الْخَلَوَاتِ I came to know about people who ascribe themselves to knowledge. Imagine people who study shuyukh and so on and so forth. They stopped being conscious of Allah watching them in private. So what did Allah do to them? Allah caused the good things that are mentioned about them in public to diminish, to disappear. Them being present is like them being absent. It's like they weren't there anymore. There was no sweetness in meeting them. The heart stopped yearning for them. All of a sudden now you are looked at differently in your community or amongst the people that loved you before. And there are many. I've got a lecture on my YouTube channel. It's called The Effects of Sins. Right? Sorry, what was the other one? Staying firm on hijab and makeup. My sisters, when it comes to the hijab, I want you guys to realize this, right? And the brothers, huh? Don't have this virtue. Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, chooses some over the other. Right? Every time you are preserving the hijab while you are outside, my sisters, remember you are being rewarded for it. Brothers ain't wearing hijab. They're not going to be getting rewarded for that. Huh? While you are struggling, especially at a time when holding on to your religion is like holding on to hot coal. You're struggling really, really hard because many people around you are not doing it, but you are. Every moment you're wearing the hijab, whether it might be in front of non-maharim, or you keep yourself at home, away from fitan, you are being rewarded for it, my sister. We are proud of you. Wallahi, we are extremely, extremely proud of you. May Allah Azza wa protect you, right? Especially in times like this, right? You should be commended for, you are the queen of this ummah, right? When dressing like this at a time when people will, you know, make all sorts of remarks. Huh? And even more difficult now to wear the niqab. You'll get mocked, you'll be ridiculed, you'll be made fun of. But you're holding on. And remember my sisters, life is short. Don't let it be that the only time that you wear a hijab is when you are being shrouded in your grave. Don't let, be, don't let that be the only time. Right? And the third was what? Makeup. Makeup. Again, brothers and sisters, right? Not brothers, I don't think that maybe they do. Huh? Especially in today's day and age. Huh? <laughs> My sisters, right? Again, it's a struggle, right? It's one thing saying it's haram, right? But we have to find an alternative. I'll give you guys an alternative. You know, when you do righteous deeds, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anumah said, Inna lil hasanati diyan lil wajh. The good deed that you do, it puts a glow on your face. And the bad deed that you carry out, it puts what? Darkness on your face. Right? Especially Qiyam al layl When you wake up in the night. Hassan al-Basri rahmatullahi was asked, Why is it that those who wake up in the night, they have the nicest of faces in the day? They secluded themselves with Allah, so Allah clothed them with His nur. Right? You don't need makeup. You need righteous deeds. And inshallah ta'ala you will glow. Right? After you woke up in the morning, put some Vaseline on your face inshallah ta'ala and you look absolutely wonderful. And these righteous deeds be in the light ta'ala will show. Right? May Allah Azza wa reward every single one of you sisters. Right? You walk outside, you're striving, right? You're not wearing the makeup, you're being rewarded. Remember that. Those who strive, you will guide them to that which is correct. Also take an example in the brothers. They don't wear makeup. Huh? And they look pretty cool, right? They look decent. 
نعم جزاك الله خير Next question inshallah ta'ala what is a secret servant of Allah and why should we all try and be that I think the meaning of secret servant here is the abd that is khafi uh, Allah loves the slave who is taqi and khafi the one who has taqwa and he's also light he's a guy who they don't invite him to the walima He's a guy who, when he knocks on the door, people don't open up the door for him. The quiet, subdued, in the background, brother or sister. The one who doesn't want people to know what they're doing. When they do good deeds, like give sadaqah, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand gave. So Allah's Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah loves the abd who is taqi khafi. <laughs> he has taqwa. And he's hidden. There's a hadith that talks about that tremendous ibadah of al-Islam, which is, <coughs> which is al-jihad. Al-jihad at its proper time and place with the ahkam and the adab and the people and so forth and so on that we don't apologize about. But nonetheless, he prays the person who, when he is put inside of the army, he just goes wherever they told him to go. If they want to put him at the front, he's at the front. If they want to make him a general, he's the general. If they want to make him the cook, he's the cook. If they want to make him the guy who's going to pour the water, bring the wudu, he doesn't have a problem. If they want to make him the guy who, when the soldiers go to sleep, he's looking in the frontiers just on watch. He doesn't care. He gets him where he fits in. That's the ab that is taqi, khafi. So Allah loves him. There's a companion's name is Ashaj Abdul Qais. Tremendous person in Jahiliya. Ashaj Abdul Qais. The Prophet told that man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have two characteristics that Allah loves. He said, what are they? He said, you're gentle. Al-Hilm, you're gentle. And Al-Anat, you take your time. You're not mustajil the way young people are, naturally. You're not in haste. You take your time. He asked the question, it's the point. Ya Rasulullah, am I like that because Allah created me like that? Or is something that I developed? He said, Allah created you like that. So there are some people in the way that Allah has created, they are loud. They can't help it. It's the environment that they came from. They are product of the environment. Some people have to struggle to tone it down, be quiet. You don't have to be the loudest cat in the house. You don't have to be seen. And then there's just that natural brother. He's just in the cut. You'll never know that he's there because he's so quiet. So those people who are naturally having that aggressive attitude or whatever, not necessarily bad, but you within yourself have to tone it down. Allah loves the one who is khafi. The best salat is the one that you do in your house. The one that people don't see, with the exception of the obligatory prayer. That's the Abdul Khafi. He's doing things in his house that people don't know that he's doing it. Every deed that we do, like sitting here on this stage, in the audience, people are seeing us. Only Allah knows who's going to get rewarded. But Ramadan and fasting for Allah is only for him. No one else, no, no, no one else knows about it. As a result of that, as a result of that, that individual is going to get a lot of reward because he's doing an ibadah that Allah loves. It's one of those ibadah that the Abd al-Khafi does. Nobody knows. So inshallah, azawajal, we make struggles and we make efforts to do our best, to do things, to keep them quiet, except where we're encouraging people. The Prophet of Islam told the people, pray the way you see me praying. So he illustrated how he prayed. He wasn't showing off. He wanted to encourage and teach people when he got on the minbar and they saw him pray. He told the people, take the rice of hajj from me. Look at me. And those companions were looking at him. So if you do something with the intention of teaching people and that's sincerity from you, you'll get the reward for that. But rest assured that a shaitan is trying to rip everybody off. Try to be the ab at taqi al khafi the one who everybody is not really you know like clapping for you 
You come, they don't know you came. They don't want to ask you for your advice. They don't want to pay attention to you. And we have people like that. Now, if you're not like that, and you're the other way, if you know a brother or a sister's like that, you should defend them. Because they get oppressed. It's the girl who's married to a guy where the sisters be dogging her out. So one of the sisters have to say, no, you can't do that to her because she won't defend herself. The brother who, he gets oppressed. You know he's like that. Now you have to use that macho man thing that you have, that strong personality, that alpha male that all y'all tripping out about. You use that now in his right place to defend the Abd al taqi al-Khafi. Analyze a'la and a'la. The, the secret servant <clears throat> we all have responsibilities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some of those responsibilities and acts of worship we do it publicly right now we are here publicly we are delivering a talk and it is my responsibility and the shuk's responsibility to correct our intentions and do it for the sake of Allah and for the benefit of the people that are listening all of you, it is your responsibility to rectify your intention, but this is a public act of worship. Attending a class or a lecture is a public act of worship. Delivering one is also a public act of worship. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also commanded us to do private acts of worship. Did you know that the prayers at night are generally more virtuous than the prayers during the day? This is why Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As used to say, لَأَنْ أُصَلِّيَ رَكْعَةً فِي اللَّيْلِ أَحَبِّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ أُصَلِّيَ عَشْرًا فِي النَّهَارِ For me to read one rak'ah, one at night, is more beloved to me than ten during the day. Why? Because lesser people, if anyone at all, would know about you praying at night in your room. Who knows? It's just you and Allah. You're being a secret servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a secret worshiper. That's the kind of ibadah you need a lot of. Why do you think fasting is such a beautiful act of worship that Allah reserves his reward very specially to himself? Fasting is mine and I will give a special reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the divine narration, the hadith al-Qudsi. Because no one knows when you're fasting. Unless you tell them, no one knows. You're coming to the masjid, Dhuhr, Asr. Some of us are fasting, others are not. Only Allah knows. You need to increase in those acts of worship. No one knows when you wake up in the morning, the adhkar that you read, if you're reading it by yourself, this is why you know the dhikr beads. The dhikr beads. Um, many of the ulama allowed it and said there's nothing wrong with it. Some of them said you shouldn't do it. But Shaykh al-Islam in said something very interesting. When he was talking about the dhikr beads, he said, you're allowed to use them, but I discourage it. Lest you show others that you're doing dhikr. Why are you showing others? Be a secret servant. Do your tasbih quietly between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallam, using your fingers. In other words, you need to stock up. We all need to stock up on secret acts of obedience. Next time that you have an opportunity to give charity, sponsor some orphans, direct debit, only you and Allah know. Only you and Allah know. Give sadaqah online. Only you and Allah know. Subhanallah. Now we have means, even means that the Salaf didn't have of concealing great acts of worship. There are some, I know earlier we spoke about there's a lot of problematic channels on YouTube and on all these platforms that are pushing out a lot of filth and a lot of haram. But there are also some great channels. And you don't know who's behind it. You don't know who's behind it. There's like a generic name. I don't know. The merciful servant. I don't know who this is. Collecting these, these lectures, putting them online for people to benefit from. Or any of other... In other words, what did this person do? He concealed himself, but he's pushing out khair. My point is, whether it is you reciting Quran by yourself in your house, in your room, whether it is you sharing um, messages around, or maybe you're, you're, you're pushing khair online, privately, or it's you praying at night, or sponsoring orphans, or fasting, remember to have a receipt of acts of worship that only you and Allah know. And this is extremely important. 
acts of worship between you and Allah that no one else shares in. Not your mother, your father, your friend, no one. Have those. And ask yourself this question. Do I have those right now? Is there anything that I do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is between me and my creator? If not, you got something to start on. Inshallah ta'ala. This is going to help you. And the scholars, they used to give an example. They used to say, and I'll conclude here. Look at your public displays of worship and your private ones. If you see that your public acts of worship are more than your private ones, then that balance needs to be changed. Do more things privately than you do publicly. And this is better for your niyyah, inshallah ta'ala, your intentions. May Allah accept all of our acts of worship, the public ones and the private ones. Ameen. Jazakallah khair, barakallahu feek. Inshallah, we want to wrap up. So I'd like to ask uh, the panelists if they would like to give the final statement, inshallah, for if anything, people would walk away from this lecture that we've been in. If they could go away with this, what would it be? Tafadhan. I'll go first so that we can finish with the misk. Khitamuhu misk. Our beautiful guest can finish off. I'll go first. I just want to uh, highlight something. This is an opportunity to have so many young sisters and brothers here in the masjid. The greatest act of worship you can do after la ilaha illallah is the prayer, the salah. My beloved brothers and sisters, your five daily prayers are non-negotiable. If you protect those five daily prayers, don't miss Fajr, don't miss Zuhur, don't miss Asr, Maghrib and Isha. Can you guys, inshallah, just relax. A couple of more minutes left. This might be the most important advice that you guys get. Yeah, just wait a couple of more minutes, inshallah ta'ala. And then if you can leave, that's a, a humble request from me. Maghrib and Isha. The five daily prayers, my brothers. Please, stay on top of them. Wallahi, stay on top of your salawat and Allah will open doors of goodness for you. Indeed, the salah, it stops you from falling into sin and into evil misdeeds. So please, focus on your salah. It is the first thing Allah will ask you about when you are resurrected. The first thing Allah will ask you about is your salah. And if it is good, everything else will be good. So, if there are a few changes you're willing to make tonight, inshallah ta'ala. If you're one of those brothers and sisters that their salah was not the best, tonight you make that change. Inshallah. If you were someone that was struggling with your salah, from tonight you ask Allah to keep you firm. And you pray your isha. And from tomorrow morning, fajr, bright and early, you start your salawat and you stick with them. Those of you that are already praying, you add the sunnah, the rawatib. Build on it. Build on your acts of worship. And I'll give you guys uh, an important point. If you are someone that not only prays your five, but adds on top of that, the rawatib and the sunnah. The, when, you, when you're wavering and your iman becomes a bit weak and everyone's iman becomes weak, you at least fall back to your five daily. But if all you pray is your five daily and your iman goes weak, what's in danger? Your five daily salawat. May we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as people that have observed the prayer. حافظوا على الصلوات والصلاة الوسطى وقوموا لله قانتين بارك الله فيكم. My parting words just for the brothers in this room, not for the sisters, because only so much can be said. But I direct my kalam to you, brothers. The Nabi of Islam, صلى الله عليه وسلم, one of his important sunnas was to develop men to take care of the religion. And he gave the men a great responsibility in this religion. And he said about the men, Allah has given superiority in a higher position of the men over the women. And that's because they spend out of what Allah has provided them with for their family. I know that there are a lot of people who are talking about the alpha male and all of this stuff. I understand. I'm not coming from that angle. I'm coming from the angle of 
We have to do a better job taking care of our mothers, our sisters, our wives, our daughters, our women folk. We have to do a better job taking care of our ummah. It's not a good thing that the women, Muslim women, are better educated than our boys. Our sons are not excelling academically, and it's a bad sign because it's going to cripple our ummah. It's going to be a problem. It's a serious challenge. This is a serious issue we're dealing with. From the most dangerous tahadiyat, challenges of our ummah, is how our shabab are underdeveloped. Big problem. We are the people who settle for less. In al-Islam, we're all encouraged to have ulu al-himma, high determination. I want to get on the first row, on the right side of the first row. That's why I want to get. I'm not that individual who I settle for a C or I come to the masjid before the imam makes the salat, I get there. No, I want to be on time. We are overwhelmed with laziness and underachievement. And I don't mean this in a bad negative way, but the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that he looked at the men. And if you were to ask the average Muslim boy, who are your heroes from the companions? He's going to say, Umar, although Abu Bakr is better. But it's the way Umar was. Abu Dujana, Khalid ibn Walid, people like that. And I can understand that. But the right answer is Abu Bakr. Because he was the bravest and he was the best and he was the most knowledgeable. And the Prophet loved him the most, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In concluding, stay balanced and this internet is a problem. You don't have the right to always have something to say. You don't have the right in our religion. You people are young. Fall back. Know your position. Yeah, as your father, your brother, your uncle, I should take your opinion if you want to get married or don't want to get married. Can't just tell you marry this one because I chose her. But in terms of the deen, in terms of halal and haram, in terms of dawah, the field of dawah in the arena is not for every Amr, Bakr, and Zayd. So the Prophet is sitting in front of all of those companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, there is a tree that resembles the believer. What tree is that? The people started giving what they thought, the elder people. Abdullah bin Umar, the narrator of the hadith said, I looked at my father, Umar, an elder. I looked at Abu Bakr, an elder, and they were quiet, so I remained quiet because I was shy to talk in front of them. Does that mean you don't have something to say? He knew the truth. He knew what it was. He said it was the date palm tree. But you saw and you see how he backed up. Our community doesn't have that. The millennials believe you're going to hear me by hook or crook. That's not the religion. The prophet told us, kabir, kabir. Let the elders talk. al barakama akabirikum. The blessings is with the older people. So it's the responsibility of the older people to develop and to, you know, work with you and all of that. But this thing about everybody has something to say is increasing the folder. Especially with some of these du'at who are coming up with all kind of new categorizations of serifi other than this. It is a fact. I'm the type of person I want good for people. I, want, I don't want to blast people. I don't want to be of those people. So I want to help people. But you see that People have hidden agendas, so you got to be careful. When we find a person like Andrew Tate, may Allah guide us and him. See what I mean? He comes out, I'm happy for his Islam, but we don't let the loud people like that just become our examples. I'm not against him. I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to make a point. And I don't mean this hating on him. And I don't mean this in a negative way. But that's the religion of Islam. It's not a religion of folda. Folda. Everybody who has a hat, throw your hat in the arena and just put your... No! It's not our religion. Because today, you will be pumped up in the media. And the next thing tomorrow is something else. So don't go for the hype. Fall back. Pump your brakes. Take it easy. Now, if someone came to you guys and said... We have to collectively, all of us, everybody in this room with our wives, children, all of us, we're going to go like Ben Israel and we're going to have to cross a wadi. The wadi, the wadi, you know where the water used to flow. We have to cross the valley where the water used to flow. 
But we have an option. They said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to let a helicopter come over you, and he's going to shine a big white light. You can see everything in front of you. You can see every piece of gas, glass, scorpion, snake, cactus, everything. But it's not guaranteed to stay on. It could cut off at any moment as you guys walk. It can cut off when half of the first group is meet, get halfway. It can cut off when you whip. Or you guys can take lanterns. And we guarantee you that that lantern is going to say lit. But you only can see a foot or two in front of you. That's it. The way the millennials are, they want the rah-rah. They want the drama. Give me the helicopter. Give me the helicopter. No. In El Islam, we have principles. And that principle is, is better for you. It's better for you to go slow with that thing right there because you're guaranteed. Leave what you doubt for that which you don't doubt. You'll be able to see, you're guaranteed to cross the thing. But the way it is today, the movies, everything, everything, the way life is, because the, 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 the soil is being prepared for a Dajjal. A Dajjal. And when he comes out, someone is the most religious person in this room. When he comes out, even that person is going to say Dajjal is Allah. Because we've just been conditioned for the rah-rah and the drama and the sound effects and the optics and what's not real. Abu Taymiyyah a few minutes ago mentioned something trying to make a point, brothers. He said to the sisters, put Vaseline on your face and come like that. And you guys started laughing. Do you know Vaseline ain't even good for you anymore? You know they found out Vaseline ain't even good for you no more. We're living in a time of senawat khada'at. What we're eating, no good. What we're using, no good. They're killing us. So I'm not one of those Illuminati cats, but I am telling you that the Nabi told us, this is the time that we're living in. So for the brothers of this community, get your education, man. Get your education so you put yourself in a better position to take care of your family and your community. The believer who is strong is better and more beloved to Allah than the believer who is weak, and in both of them is good. Strength here, strength to do MMA, to defend himself, defend his religion. And strength here also means he has money. He can give sadaqah. He can help the community. As for the one who is an underachiever and we got to take care of him, that's a musibah. I never said punch in the face. I said MMA. I never said competition. MMA. Learn how to defend yourself. That if someone, like I always tell, he's a bully, you're going to be the one who run from the bully all the time? So I don't want to get too stretched out here because I'll get in trouble now. But I'm telling you, learn how to defend yourself and get a job and get a degree and don't be a bum. Now, does it mean if you don't have a degree, you're a bum? No, doesn't mean that. But if you're an underachiever, you have the ability, but you don't do it. You are dropping the ball as it relates to our community. So let us take care of our mothers and not make things difficult for them. Some of them are single mothers. You stop being a baby. Me, myself, and I. Give your moms a hard time, but when you hang out with the brothers, you're a little bunny rabbit. You're the nicest guy on the planet. But with your mother, your sisters, you an ignited fire, some of us. That's my advice to the brothers, and don't take every Amr, Bakr, and Zaid who's talking as an example. People are talking, and they ain't saying nothing. Last thing, for the sisters and you people, and I may never see you again, take this religion and be upon the sunnah. What I call a selefia. Not rough and tough, but what those companions were on. How they understood that Quran and that sunnah. That's what we all have to strive for. But don't be one of them rough and tough people who you're just an intolerant, anti-sociable individual. You're a problem. Don't be like that. But I bite my tongue for no one. We have to be people on the sunnah, not people on innovation and deviance and all this whackness that's going on right now. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to bless all of you guys with the khayr of the dunya and the akhirah. Sheba, Sheba, let's roll out, my man. Right. It's... 
ככה יהיה רייט. שייח סניק טאו, ריאו קוויק, אה? To conclude, my brothers and my sisters, first and foremost, I just want to thank the Masjid for putting together this program, Sheikh Mustafa, and also Sheikh Abu Sama. I'm actually happy that he left because I don't want to praise him too much to his face. He's one of our elders who has helped a lot of us. Right? Yes, he was talking about the elders. It's always very, very important to do istishara, to consult the elders. Even the poet, he says, إِنَّ الْأُمُورَ إِذَا الْأَحْدَاثُ دَبَّرَهَا if you see issues, just, but he was my roommate when I arrived in Al Medina. At a time when I felt like a peasant, forsaken, it is as if I was walking around, nobody wanted to talk to me, right? I was given a very, very hard time when I came to Al Medina. I even began to wish that I never ever came out on camera. And there was only a very few people that had no problem to be seen around me. Because if they were seen around me, they'll be given a very, very hard time by the bullies, right? I'm not trying to scare you guys away from El Medina, but you had, you know, pockets here and there of people who would give people a hard time. And he was one of the very few who allowed me into his room, right? And was nice to me. I even remember he took me to Akawi, which was a restaurant when we first came, and he was real, real nice. And we've had a relationship ever since, advising one another, speaking to one another. He may see something that I'm doing that is wrong and he'll maybe what? Open a discussion and vice versa. And this is how the brothers should be, right? We're not always going to be on the same page on everything, but we are there to be by each other's side. And this is how the da'wah is going to grow. Second thing that I want to point out, my brothers and my sisters, and this is very, very important. One of my cousins, who has a lot of relatives here in Birmingham, who's now moved to London, called me and he said to me, Muhammad, can you explain why you are being maybe criticized for this, 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 and this, and that? He done a very noble, righteous deed, which is to verify information. Right? You guys are going to walk out of this masjid, and people are going to be in your ear. This guy is like this, this guy is like that. This is never ending. Earlier I spoke about people falling off the religion. Right? You guys really want to know why I don't want to move to Birmingham? Because it's fola. It's chaotic. You might be going to one masjid, you walk out, someone speaks in your ear, and then khalas. That student is gone, he's gone somewhere else. Constantly, right? Birmingham has a lot of khair, but it has a lot of chaos as well. Right? Sheikh Mustafa may disagree with me, but the point of the matter is, verifying information, double-checking, asking, is like something that has become sunnah mahjura. Something that has been forsaken, no one does that anymore. And then you're just going around in circles. Your youth goes by and you haven't benefited anything. You haven't learned anything. Because you're just busy with qil wal qal. He said, she said. Who's the victim in all of this? You. Who's just going around in circles. Learn your religion, my brothers and my sisters. I, wallahi, make dua for those who verify information. Who come to me and say, Abu Taymiya, you said X, Y, and Z. Can you tell me maybe the reason why you've done it? There are different perspectives. It's one thing being upon the Quran and Sunnah, and then there's another thing when it comes to issues that are a lot more broad, ijtihadi related issues, weighing the pros and the cons. Don't be a victim in all of this never ending cycle that people get caught up in, and the whole youth goes by and he has not learned his religion. We've seen it and we still are seeing it, and a lot don't seem to be smelling the coffee. Number three, my brothers and my sisters, the third point that I want to quickly mention is the fitting of women. We're living in a time and age where women have been objectified. They've become like sexualized objects. A toothpaste is being sold and right next to it on a billboard you have a half-naked woman. What on earth does a half-naked woman got to do with a toothpaste? Right? Especially on social media, guys. Everything has become so sexualized and this is destroying our hearts. Stop telling yourself you're a tough guy. Right? Stop telling yourself that you're tough. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, مَا تَرَكْتُ فِتْنَةً أَضَرْ عَلَىٰ أُمَّةِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ I haven't left a fitna that is far greater upon my ummah than women. Shaitan uses subtle tricks. When he tricked Adam 
and his wife, Eve, not Steve, Adam and Eve, right? When he tricked them, he used very subtle tactics, my brothers and my sisters. He didn't say, oh, this haram, go and do it. It will be beautified. Sometimes a sister slips into your DMs and then shaitan whispers, give her da'wah. She ends up giving you da'wah with her looks and her images that she ends up sending to you. We have an ongoing right, trend where they tell you, you need to be tough. Having the big muscle sometimes deludes you. Oh, you can huh, take the heat. No, you can't. Get out the kitchen, brother. You can't take the heat. And it is driving a lot of us to destruction. And social media has been used to do that. Right? I think his name is Naom Chomki. He's an American intellectual, a linguist. He said, he who controls the media controls the mind. The one who understands that has understood something very important. Know that social media is not in your best interest. Earlier I spoke about what? America and the UK, right? The majority want to be YouTubers and vloggers. Ah? China who created TikTok, when they, or when their youth were asked, what do you think they said? Astronauts, uh, engineers, doctors, and whatever have you. That should be enough for you to smell the coffee, guys. A lot of that which you see is not in your best interest. These are three important points that I want to leave with you guys. And last but not least, brothers and sisters. I don't give lectures because I want to get a rise out of the crowd. My whole sole purpose when I give these lectures is to maybe inspire you to start your journey to seek knowledge. These lectures, these get-togethers, what it does, it increases your iman. It's like paracetamol, gives you that buzz, huh? that boost. But if you don't maintain that, you're just going to see it dropping again. You have to be actively seeking knowledge. We have to be learning about Allah. At-Tawheed, brothers and sisters. Earlier, Muhammad asked, why have we become so loose when it comes to sins? And that is because the veneration of Allah Azza wa has died in our hearts. We are not learning about Allah. Open up the books of Tawheed and study about Allah Jalla fi ula. The more you learn about Him, the more you will feel that connection, my brothers and my sisters. We have to start that journey now. Otherwise, don't be surprised tomorrow when your children... Huh? I'm going to say something. Huh? Should I, should I, should I hold back? Little. There's, there's, there's a lot of videos that are extremely colorful on my YouTube channel. Go watch that, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and also, when I recently spoke about Christmas, spoke a lot about that, we will see a next generation, my brothers and my sisters, that are going to confuse you. You're going to be confused of what they come out with. Right? And that's if you don't learn your religion. How do you expect them to learn, brothers and sisters? How do you expect them to understand normative Islam? May Allah Azza wa bless you all. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I love you all for the sake of Allah. Honestly, coming here, seeing all of these glowing faces in Masjid Noor, and then you're the youth program today, to see all of these glowing faces hungry to listen, it honestly has been extremely heartwarming for myself. There is still a lot of khair in Birmingham Sharif, May Allah Azza bless you all. Is everyone here from Birmingham? Really? Subhanallah. There are classes that are conducted, my brothers and my sisters. Shaykh Mustafa just told me about it now. Where you can be actively seeking knowledge. Try and attend some of these classes which will better your understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barakallah feekum wa ahsanallahu ilaykum. And if I don't see you guys again, I ask Allah Azza wa to reunite us in the hereafter. And my sisters, keep going. You guys are doing amazing in this sexualized society. Keep going, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers, Allah barik, because of the numbers that are here, make sure when you leave in, inshallah, everything that you heard, make sure that it's in your heart and to be respectful when you're out there, inshallah ta'ala. Not causing any harm to anyone when you're out there. Or uh, any unnecessary crowds and traffic. Barakallah fikum wa jazakum Allah khair. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika shalwa